Hi, I'm Phil Donahue. And I'm Arlo Thomas. And we're going on a series of double dates to find out what makes a marriage last. What a kick it was to head down to the nation's capital for a visit with Bob Woodward and Elsa Walsh, two journalists under one roof. As an old newsman myself, I felt right at home. You and Bob began talking about how to save the world the moment we walked in. They live in a beautiful section of Georgetown. Bob bought this great colonial house just a few years before he and Elsa met. But together they've turned it into a lovely home. We were greeted by Maggie, their miniature poodle, who followed us from room to room as we set up our gear, just like a cub reporter. They had laid out some delicious snacks, which I'm afraid we dove into somewhat noisily at times. Once we settled in, Elsa talked about growing up as one of six kids with four sisters and a brother. I was surprised to learn that just like Marlo, as a young girl, she never dreamt of getting married. My parents were Irish immigrants. My mom was actually eight months pregnant with me when she came with my dad. My dad was a civil engineer and he'd lived sort of all over the world and wanted to go to San Francisco for a year. He thought it would be fun. My dad was um, bipolar and um, handsome, intelligent, but, you know, pretty up and down, moody. So she had a rough time with your father. Yes and no. They had a lot of fun, but he could be difficult. And uh, my mom... She was just this sort of safe harbor of of both love and fun and acceptance. And when I think about marriage and what was important that I learned from her was just that you're in it and you you stay in it. Is that why you didn't want to get married? Because you have to stick with it forever? No, you know, you always like to think of yourself as being sort of an independent operator with all your own thoughts, being very original, but... All the great icons at that time, you know, Gloria Steinem's, you know, that girl, (laughs) they weren't getting married. You know, that was being strong and that was being um, adventurous. And so I think I wanted to be part of that movement. So when I met Bob, I didn't want to marry you, but I wanted to be with you. You met in the newsroom? Yes. Mm -hmm. Were you smitten right away? No, smitten is an (laughs) understatement. (laughs) Ben Bradley's wife, Sally Quinn, brought her in to meet the editors. I was the local editor. And, you you know, there's just something. Uh, how old were you then? I was really young. You were 20. I was 22. 22. Oh, my. And you were 37 I was, or 36. I was 36 or 37 and just head over heels in love, physically, yeah. emotionally. And the added benefit of the risk. Now, you may not agree, because you sometimes didn't like the secrecy. No, that's true. Um, but I understood it. Why were you secret? Were you, you weren't married, right? No, but I wasn't working for him, but he was in the chain of command. And, um, you know, being in journalism, it was like a hotbed of gossip all the time. Yeah. Part of it is so much of what you do during your reporting process is secretive. And you can't really talk about it with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And He can trust you. He can trust me. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we were talking about <laughs> is that, and we were tra- just this weekend, Bob was saying, when did I tell you about Deep Throat? When did I tell you who it was again? Was it like 82? Or 83, I said, no, I think it was 81. I think we'd been going out and had a a relationship for maybe a year. Uh And we were out to dinner on M Street. Remember that? Yeah. And you asked, you said, who was Deep Throat? And I said, well, uh, you know. Wow, you told her. I know. How many people had you told up till then? Uh, Carl and Bradley. And that was it. So why did you trust her? Look at her. No, I mean, but... it just be be around her, you know, when you see it. You must have been really impressed that he trusted you with I that. I was. I was really, I was I was surprised you told you me. You were, really. I was very surprised. See, we yes. never talked about it no. afterwards. Or no. Except... no, I thought you might take it back. <laughs> <laughs>
like that. I just love that he instinctively trusted her with one of the biggest secrets in American history. I got the sense that their connection to each other has a lot to do with their childhoods. Elsa had this incredibly stable family, even though her father was bipolar. But my family was not stable at all. My parents were divorced when I was quite young, about 12 or or 13. And mother had been in the hospital and had a nervous breakdown. And my father came to say that uh, my mother is out, uh, out of the hospital now and she's married Tom Barnes, who was my father's first best friend. And I remember thinking to myself, ah, you're in this alone. Whoa. You can have a mother and a father and friends, and but you're in it alone. And it was a very kind of just, you know, when you're 12, okay. you think your mom's going to love you enough to not leave the marriage and marry somebody else, <laughs> let alone my father's best friend. And um, it was so painful, but also a kind of, oh, okay, I'm, this, I'm in this alone, mm. and i got to figure it out. Oh, how touching. And uh, after college, I was in the Navy, and I, because I'd signed up for Naval ROTC, and I married uh, a woman who was my high school sweetheart, as they say. She was a very smart, lovely person. And when I was off on a, you know, with marriage just fell apart. And it was a kind of second act of the, oh, okay, mm-hmm. you're in this alone. Aww. And then after Nixon resigned, I was in a romance uh, and got married a second time. And we had Tally, and that didn't last. And uh, it didn't last because she essentially, we had Tally and left with Tally. And so that was kind of the third act of, oh, okay, you're in this alone. So when we started going out and when my mother died. I wanted to get married, but I was embarrassed to propose it to you because I felt I'd had all of these two earlier failed marriages and you were, you know, wonderful. And we were married in 1989, I think. I was surprised when Bob asked me to marry him because it was um, unexpected. And I remember... Yeah, we've been together how long then? Nine years. And it was unexpected. <laughs> it was unexpected. We were out at our house in Maryland, and we have, were sitting out on our this little small sunroom that we have, and we were talking about his mom, um, who had died. And he said, um, you know, nothing would make me happier than if you would marry me. And instead of feeling so shocked, I was so excited. Aww. So that ever since then, I really, I love being married. I mean, I love being married to Bob. But I, I love the idea of saying to each other and to other people that we're in it together. That realization is liberating and quite empowering because until that moment, it was kind of, you know, the, the people are going to desert you, the unexpected, the surprise. After all those people leaving, did you have a feeling that this is one who wouldn't leave? Sure. Because she said so and acted so. And what she did, I mean, we were talking somewhat recently, and I mentioned something about you don't know when people are going to fail you or you are going to fail yourself. And I thought of Lord Jim when he jumps. And you remember what you said? Yes, I said, I don't jump. (laughs) Uh, That's great.
Elsa not only didn't leave, she dove into their relationship headfirst. And over the years, as a writer herself, she has become an invaluable contributor to Bob's work. She would look at sections, look at chapters, look at the book, made it her enterprise, uh-huh. and said, this is important. You should do this. Did you do every note she gave you, or did you not? No, of course not. <laughs> some of them were kooky. <laughs> but enough but for good. We, but we never fought about it, which is so interesting over the period of a year at least. We never really fought about work. I think you and I, very early on in our relationship, decided that when we were looking at each other's work, we would always be honest. We wouldn't be cruel. You know, you hand something to someone that you've worked on and you think, ah. You weren't always happy. There was one point when you were doing this, the book, and you brought me down some new chapter, and I worked on it, and you came down, and you went, Yeah. But she was yeah. right. Yeah. You know, and as I realize, it would not have been done as completely or as logically without her. That's great. Elsa has a way of, it's the power of empathy, of listening, and the power of questioning. When I come back from an interview, it's like a mini interrogation. <laughs> also does it. Oh yeah, to me. And I sometimes bristle at it, but I've come to realize it helps me understand what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And that happens between the two of us most days we're together. I realized Elsa's a therapist, doesn't have a license, but practices. <laughs> My primary patient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the primary patient. Uh, I think one of the things that we've always sort of felt um, is that we're a team, professionally and personally, and that we've always been really involved in each other's work. With my work, um, there's probably been no person who comes anywhere close to being the sort of my advisor, the encourager, the person who says, you know, take a leap, you know. But when you talk about doing Divided Lives, your book about the three women, I just listened. I I think you and I at that point had been married. How many? Three or four years, but I, we had been together for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And you started working on the book as a kind of... I was trying to figure out my own life. I was trying to figure out what was the next stage for me. Should we have a child? Should we not have a child? And um, I'm a very deliberate person, (laughs) Uh, probably too much so. And you would always say to me, well, who are the women you know who are happy? It's kind of like your question. Who are the people who have marriages that last and why? And you actually, you said, why don't you go out and like talk to people? Why don't you sort of figure it out? And did that help you want to become a mother? It did. Yeah, very much so. And you came up with you know. what are the ingredients of a balanced life for a woman? So what was, do you remember them? It was uh, creating a home, creating a nest for yourself, time with your friends, relationship in a marriage and a family, your work life, your sense of self of who you are, and also just time to be by yourself. I like to be by myself a lot, Mm -hmm. which is probably a good thing in our marriage, right? (laughs) You like to be by yourself, too? No. You rattle around. Well, I rattle around, and I waste time. We'll have more after a quick break. We're back to our conversation with Bob Woodward and Elsa Walsh. They've been together for 40 years, so Marlo threw a real Woodward-type question. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made in your marriage, and how did you come back from it? I can remember one particular incident. Um, Oh, good. This was when you were working on The Commanders, which was his book about the Pentagon, Colin Powell. First Gulf War. 
And Bob, every weekend we'd go to Maryland, he had work to do and always busy. After you had finished the reporting on the book and turned it in, but it was not yet published, we were out there for a weekend. And I got up in the morning and I said, oh, I was going to the store. And I didn't come back for about six or seven hours. Right? Oh, my gosh. This was before cell phones. And I got back and you were, you couldn't decide whether you were furious or you were relieved. And you were almost crying because you said you were um, planning my funeral. You were deciding whether you should bring the dogs to the funeral or not. <laughs> and I looked at him. I was like, oh, my God, he's crazy. What's going on here? And um, he said, well, you never called. You never told me. And I said, well, but you've been busy. You've been busy every weekend for the last year. What do you think I've been doing? I've been, like, I've been keeping myself busy. And suddenly he was free. Uh-huh. He didn't have that reporting. And I had gotten into my own little world and my own little routine of doing things and not checking in. And I realized actually that you needed me more than I thought. When he was available. Well, <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I know that guy. But I think there was a little <laughs> bit of you were so upset. Six or seven hours I'm thought, going out shopping. Did you do it to show him something? No, no, I was just, I maybe, was just, maybe. no, I did not. Well, no, I did not. I was and just, every every weekend when he was talking on the phone. I would just do something. You know, I just it didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel I needed to check in because yeah. he was already checked in somewhere else mm-hmm. or checked out somewhere else. Right. And... So I thought, I think that there are like moments like that in which then you say, oh, hmm, we need a readjustment here. Mm-hmm. Need more attention. How do you bring up a hard topic? How do, you, how do you handle a hard topic? You usually say, I want to talk to you about something. <laughs> and then we sit down. And you say... <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> let's not have this conversation. Or let's kind of, because you are kind of. Um, I'll talk about it for a little bit, but yeah, I also think sometimes I, people make a mistake. And I've been in there myself. To death, yeah. I mean, I have done, so I'm not sort of an adverse to that at all. Um, uh, I think you can make things worse sometimes by trying to just pull it apart. And, you know, maybe that's just a defense mechanism or something. But I think I, I mean, I went through, I did a, a fair amount of cognitive behavioral therapy at one point in my life. Um, do you know what that is? Yes. I think very early on in our marriage, and you and I talked about this, that, that we would try to always assume good intentions. And that when someone is being a jerk, it's not that they're being a jerk to you. Is there just being a jerk? It's not directed. You see, this is the theme Elsa brings up. Good intentions. Are there, are there bad intentions? And as best I can recall, I don't think she's ever done anything with bad intention toward me or I toward her. And she will let things go if... I'm Especially, except if I talk to my therapist about it. <laughs> <laughs> you do never have marriage counseling, right? Mm-hmm. But what did you call this man? A Pref- cognitive behavioral therapist. T- t- tell him what they do. It deals a lot with anxiety. Um, I'm just going to fail. I know I'm going to fail. And so what the cognitive behavioral therapist does is teaches you how to identify that distorted thinking. And he'll say... When people are in states of high anxiety and distorted thinking, they usually are in their catastrophic thinking modes. And most people go to five, which is like, this is just like horrible. And in reality, when you really look at something, it usually is about a one or a two. And so it trains you to see, it's not saying it's not a problem or you shouldn't be afraid. It's like, it's like you don't have to be as afraid. So let's say you're in your bedroom and you hear, 
a huge crash and it's the middle of the night. Um, you might think, oh my God, someone has broken into my house. They're going to kill me. The cognitive behavioral therapist would say, well, how likely is that? <laughs> it's much more likely that it actually is a branch that fell, fell down outside. Mm-hmm. So it's the one or two. So it trains you to see the one or two rather than the five. That's great. The other day, and this was maybe a month ago, something was bugging me, and we had one of our conversations. <laughs> and I said, in 2016, um, uh, the Trump campaign, I felt for good reason I didn't work hard enough to get his tax returns and so on. And we had talked about it at the time and consoled, and I was really feeling bad. And Elsa said, well, you know, what you did was reasonable and, um, you know, you're not carrying the world on your back, old boy. <laughs> A version of you're not King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I said, well, I really feel I kind of let myself down. And so, and by talking about it, it was a five for me Mm -hmm. because I was churning and going on it. You let the whole world down. Yeah. (laughs) And then then she, she said, well, that's not your job and you couldn't and there were, you know, there were reasons, there are always reasons for not doing something and they're, reason, they're reasonable and it got, I don't think it got me down to a one or two, but it got me to a three. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> no, but that's great. Bob oftentimes says, what, what can I do to make you happy? And I'll say, that's not your job. Uh-huh. That's my job. Assume good intentions. Keep your promise. Don't leave the house angry. Uh huh. And do you, are you into this thing of don't go to bed angry? Well, I so, try to be, but that's not always as easy. <laughs> Letty Pogovin said, "I have no desire to sit up all night until somebody admits they're wrong." Yeah. So no. I just I, so we there, always we I mean we we actually don't we we do not argue very often, which is. Good for me. I like it that way. Maybe not as good for you. Um, I don't like arguing. But I think sometimes having discussions isn't worth it. And uh, you do, and because you know where it's is, going. Pardon? You know where it's going to go. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it matters. It, no, it's it just not, matter sometimes. It's just not worth it. And when you have a spouse who's you know, will let things go, even maybe things she shouldn't let go. There are certain expectations we have of each other that we actually fulfill. And in no way have we made the other feel they're in this alone. And I think that there is a kind of a code word that we have, and that is, I love you. Is that something you say when things are hard? Uh, no, no, just, oh, just all the time. And each morning when you generally get up before me, and yeah. you're down here having the coffee, and I come down and give him a kiss and say, I love you. Yeah, and I say, yeah. I love you. Uh, or nice. going to bed at night, we say, I love you, I love you. And so it's a kind of, there's no volcano. It's so much easier. Churning under the, uh, under the surface. And, you know, particularly when we get older, we're at a point in our lives where we have obligations beyond just our family and ourselves. And I always talk about the fourth act of your life. You have the first act of getting educated and then second act of deciding how you're going to live and what your career is going to be. And then your third act, the middle years. 
And then there, was a, there actually is a fourth act, isn't there? I mean, you two are living a fourth act. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to be as wise and focused and consequence-oriented as you were in the first three acts. I really think that the lives are enriched by discussion and analysis, and I think it's good you're picking at it. I think we learned something. To appreciate what we have. Yeah, that's right. I could not understand the value of Elsa if I was not able to, I think, be analytical about the past of, you know, oh, I'm in this alone. And if I couldn't understand that, I wouldn't understand the gift. That's Bob Woodward and Elsa Walsh, the gratitude they have for one another. It just goes to show you, you can do the dog-eat-dog -dog world of journalism and still make home your own little sanctuary. Until next time, I'm Phil Donahue. And I'm Marlo Thomas. Double Date is a production of Pushkin Industries. The show was created by us and produced by Sarah Lilly. Michael Bahari is associate producer. Musical adaptations of It Had to Be You by Stellwagen Symphonette. Marlo and I are executive producers, along with Mia Lobel and Lital Molad from Pushkin. Special thanks to Jacob Weisberg, Malcolm Gladwell, Heather Fain, John Schnars, Carly Migliori, Eric Sandler, Emily Rostek, Jason Gambrell, Paul Williams, and Bruce Kluger. If you like our show, please remember to share, rate, and review. Thanks for listening. <laughs>